Okay, great. Um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everybody um, from all over. It's really, really nice to see such familiar names in the chat. It's really comforting, actually, in this time. Um, so, yeah, so if anyone doesn't know me, I'm Tessine Adam, and I just finished my, my PhD about, um, yeah, a month, a month or two ago. And yeah, today I'm going to be presenting on the final chapter or yeah, sort of the culmination of my PhD, um, which is um, approaches to designing justice oriented MOOCs. Um, so I'm going to give you uh, an outline just of my overall PhD, um, the introduction, the context, the research questions, the literature, literature review, um, conceptual framework and methodology. And then I'll jump over into the major findings. Um, so there might be a little bit of um, hoops to jump through because I'm going to basically go from the introduction of my PhD to the final section with my findings. But um, if there's any gaps, you can go ahead and ask me in the Q&A. Um, so basically, um, what I'll be presenting today is four decision-making spheres. And they are basically framing more production conceptualizing the MOOC, situating the MOOC, and creating and implementing the MOOC. And so I'll, I'll unpack these as we go along. Um, so to give you a, just a brief introduction, my PhD um, was based in South Africa and um, within the context of educational inequalities that stem from colonialism and apartheid, and then post-apartheid um, due to many um, insufficient attempts at reforms. To, to rectify the education system, um, where in some cases people have actually said um, the education system has gotten worse um, with regard to um, inequalities and based on race. Um, so uh, adding to this, um, in, in uh, 2015 and 2016, uh, South Africa was shaken by many student protests, the fees must fall and roads must fall protests. Um, which really highlighted um, how alienating university spaces can be um, for black students um, and the fact that universities often centered Euro Eurocentric curriculum and pedagogies. And so um, this idea of decolonization was very much brought to the surface of, um, of um, the education, educational issues in South Africa. So, um, yeah, my, my research, it looks at this intersection, right? The two themes being um, these educational inequalities in South Africa and um, the, uh, the potential for MOOCs to attempt to address some of these inequalities. And um, this is particularly because there, were, there are three South African universities that have joined the global MOOC movement uh, on Coursera, edX, and FutureLearn. And basically, I wanted to investigate um, how these MOOCs from African context and perspective could contribute to the global MOOC space. Um, so um, within this context of MOOCs, um, MOOCs, are, um, uh, MOOCs are not, uh, MOOCs and the OER um, have often sh um, shown a few inequalities. So just to read some of the statistics, 89% of um, English repositories of OER come from the global North and North America, and only 1% come from South Africa. And with regard to um, the race of MOOC designers, only 1.7 and 1.1% 1 .1 of uh, MOOC producers are Black on Future Learn and Coursera. And in some of the research that I had done um, in 2017, only 7 0.3% of MOOCs on Coursera were from the Global South. So you can see there's quite a few inequalities um, in knowledge production within the OER and MOOC space. And um, this was sort of the problems that I wanted to investigate and see um, what South African MOOCs could contribute to this, to in this global, global Um, sorry, but okay, so I'll give you just an overview of my uh, research question. So 
Um, I had um, four sub-research questions and a main research question. So um, the first two, oh, okay, well, the overall research question was, to what extent do or could MOOCs, particularly those produced in South Africa, support the educational needs, preferences, and aspirations of marginalized, peri-urban South African youth and address the material, cultural, epistemic, political, and geopolitical injustices they face? Um, Are you still there, Taskeen? Have we lost data? You can't hear it at the moment, I don't think. Unless it's just me. Okay. Taskeen did say she might have trouble with uh, Wi Fi or data. So we'll give her a minute to come back in. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> I should play some music, shouldn't I, Joe? Open it. Um, we lost you for a moment. So just say, Tuskey, we lost you for a moment there, but you're back now. That's good. So. Okay. I am still on the research side, Cathy, so um, it should be fine. Um, yeah. So, yeah, the fourth research question or the sub research question focused on um, South African MOOC designers' conceptualizations of justice and how they sought to address injustices. Now, um, my literature, oh, okay, let me switch my camera off. Yeah. Is that better? Okay, so um, my literature re a review um, focused on many aspects, um, outlining, uh, you know, content pedagogy in the MOOC, OEM and MOOC space, but, um, it would take me quite a long time to unpack my entire literature review. So I'll just outline the, the three main um, critiques that I focused on in my um, PhD. So the first one was the neoliberal critique. So basically looking at how um, uh, the OEM uh, or the open openness can be co-opted for neoliberal agendas. And this sort of problematized open washing and the use of these terminologies to basically uh, be used for branding or marketing or commercial interests. Okay, and then the second um, uh, critique was the social injustice critique. So basically outlining that um, the idea of openness isn't actually good in and of, of itself, right? And openness needs to be coupled with social justice. So openness, by itself does not equal equity. Um, so yeah, that was the social injustice critique. And then the third critique was the neo or is the neo colonial critique. And this builds upon the social injustice critique, but it adds a further dimension to the cultural, epistemic, and geopolitical imbalances within the open education movement. And so this then also highlights that not only are MOOCs not in and not only is openness not inherently good, but it's also not necessarily universally good for everyone. So it might not always be the best solution for everyone. Um, and then, yeah, Laura Sezenovitz also critiqued um, the skewed geopolitics of knowledge and um, how the open education landscape could actually have increased the this, this skewing of knowledge. And yeah, the third um, part of that was also that um, uh, openness can sometimes um, promote the superiority of Western knowledges. So, yeah, moving on to my conceptual framework, um, I built this from two angles, from the social justice frameworks based on uh, Frazier and then Hodgkinson, Williams and Trotter, 
And then on the other side, I drew on various decolonial scholars, such as Maldonado Tonez, Cross Google, and in Jovo Um, And basically, I came to three overlapping um, dimensions. And those are the cultural epistemic injustices. So this addresses um, dominant conceptions of knowledge that exclude differing histories, values, narratives, and worldviews. Then uh, material injustices. And this addresses the causes of resource, infrastructural, geographical, and socio socioeconomic inequalities. Um, and then the third one is geopolitical and political injustices. And this addresses um, relations of power that can reproduce racial, class, sexual, gender, geopolitical, uh, sorry, geographical, spiritual, and linguistic hierarchies. Um, so I actually have a separate presentation that unpacks this conceptual framework much more. But if you want, we can we can talk about it more in the Q and A. Um, so to just give you a quick outline of my methodology, like I said, I had two groups. So I had um, the um, marginalized youth on one side, and that was 250 participants. And um, with these participants, I um, I, I ran um, an online course workshop with them. So it was a full day course, um, and we did a course on basic career development. And within the course, I had surveys embedded into them. So I had seven surveys. You can see the types of surveys on the screen. And yeah, and that was um, the research I did with marginalized um, very urban South African youth. Then on the other side, I um, interviewed MOOC designers. So 27 South African MOOC designers and also eight um, designers from, from Harvard and um, MIT. Um, the, the eight um, Harvard and MIT interviews were actually quite opportunistic. So the main focus was my South African based um, interviews. Um, yeah, so moving on. Um, no, actually, it wasn't one uh, full day work uh, one workshop. I did multiple workshops in groups of about twenty. So I I went to different um, computer training centers that had about um, twenty computers in them. Um, these these were special centers set up in um, rural and peri urban areas by a specific NGO that I used to work for. So I was fortunate to access these centers. Um, Sure, okay, so moving on now to, to the actual um, topic for today. Um, I wanted to first highlight four categories of MOOCs that I had outlined regarding justice. So um, the first one would be a MOOC that perpetuates um, injustices. And this would be a MOOC um, that perhaps gives historical nar narratives that could exclude certain histories and viewpoints, whether they do this intentionally or inadvertently. Um, the second MOOC would be a MOOC that is based on open philosophies, but doesn't actually um, particularly address injustices. So this could be a MOOC that uses a certain software that, or program that's openly licensed, but um, if it's you know fully online, for example, it might not address the technical uh, technological barriers. Then um, the third and fourth, I say these with a lot of hesitance because I'm not. I'm not 100% sure of these groups yet, so we can also chat about this in, in the Q&A's time. But I have separated MOOCs that um, strive for justice, but do not necessarily actively include marginalized groups, and then uh, MOOCs uh, that strive for justice and include marginalized groups. So the reason that I did this was because when I reviewed um, the various MOOCs, um, I found that a lot of them did strive for justice. They could, um, you know, empower journalists or activists or engineers uh, you know, to, to strive for environmental or social justice, um, but they weren't particularly aimed at marginalized groups. Um, and by that, I mean, they wouldn't have particularly been designed for offline context, or they wouldn't have been at the entry, entry level. So for example, in, in a health science, you would need a lot of background knowledge. And um, so someone from a marginalized background may not be able to access that MOOC because they don't have the background knowledge for it. 
And, um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that the MOOC doesn't promote justice. So um, that, is, that is why I made that subtle differentiation between the two. And then, yeah, so the MOOC that did include marginalized groups would be one that um, was focused on um, uh, resource constraint areas. So um, the next thing is basically I wanted to outline the three um, main arguments uh, that I promoted in this chapter. Um, the slide is taking a bit long. There we go. Okay, so the first um, key argument that I make is that there is no one-size-fits-all framework to designing justice-orientated MOOCs. So actually, what I found from um, all my interviews and from my um, evaluation of the of um, about 15 MOOCs is that um, justice was often strived for in different ways, depending on um, the purpose and the target group, but also strongly impacted by who the MOOC designer was and what the MOOC's philosophical underpinnings were. And I'll unpack these um, each of these points separately over a few slides. So the second um, key argument was that MOOC designers need to examine their subjectivities and how this shapes epist epistemological framing of the MOOC from its conceptualization. And here I have actually just put a citation to another paper of mine. Um, and this is a paper where I emphasize the importance of epistemic diversity in MOOC designers and how MOOC designers' identities strongly impact the way that they design MOOCs and the way that they attempt to address injustices. Um, and the emphasis on, on point two is from conceptualization. And you'll see in my next slide. Um, that the fact that um, the decisions that are made at conceptualization often impact the entire MOOC and the, the entire process going forward. Um, the third argument that I, that I make is that greater emphasis is needed on factors outside of the MOOC construction. And this means that factors beyond content, outcomes, assessments, processes, pedagogies, and even praxis. Um, and the reason for this is that um, the uh, MOOC designers often jump to, to these factors before situating the MOOC. And that means before considering the social, political, environmental, and technological context that the MOOC is situated in, as well as the context of, of the MOOC designers and the context of um, the MOOC participants. So these are the overall three arguments that, that I make um, throughout this chapter. Um, so now we'll move on to the actual decision-making spheres. So um, these decision-making spheres are not necessarily sequential. They're off, they rather they're nested within each other. Um, so the first one is framing the MOOC, produ framing MOOC production. And this um, just gives a bigger, bigger picture understanding of what actually influences MOOC production um, beyond the MOOC designer. So at an institutional level and at a platform um, choice level. Um, so I outline these. Just a note that uh, I haven't been able to unpack all of these um, subcategories in this presentation. So um, the ones in bold are the ones I'll go to go through today, but there are some, some parts that I'll, I'll be leaving out. So like I mentioned in the previous slide, um, the second argument was the importance of, uh, okay, can everyone still hear me? Deb says she's lost sound. So um, the second level is uh, yeah, conceptualizing the MOOC. And this, this is what I emphasized in the second key argument. So th this talks about all the decisions that make that uh, contribute to deciding what the purpose and the target of the MOOC is, and also what the philosophical underpinnings of the MOOC is. Um, then situating the MOOC then um, unpacks um, the, the participants' uh, context and the MOOC designers' context. So the technological accessibility, the language accessibility, the support that learners need and awareness and um, advertising needed to promote the MOOC. 
And then um, lastly, the, the most obvious of them is constructing and implementing the MOOC. So basically, I talk about power structures between the MOOC instructor or facilitator and um, the, the participants, uh, the pedagogical, pedagogical approaches and participation and content. So basically, um, the next few slides that I'm going to talk through basically um, reflect the, the best practices or the the leverage points or the decisions or the factors that I can outline um, that could help one to design um, better justice oriented MOOC. But I've clearly tried to avoid presenting this as a framework or as a um, because uh, there are many variations and the different ones shot from context to context. And so basically I'm just presenting what I have learned, and this this could be or could not be useful to to other contexts. So um, first, I'll just outline the various different institutional rationales for MOOCs. So um, there were four universities in South Africa that I interviewed, and uh, sorry, people, uh, MOOC designers from four universities. And they outlined various reasons that their MOOCs chose to invest in, in that their universities chose to invest in MOOCs. And a lot of the um, reasonings fell around um, reputation, increasing, uh, you know, uh, showcasing research, showcasing African knowledge was something that was across the South African universities. Um, well, uh, and actually, that's a point I'll come to at the end in terms of of sometimes African knowledge was just seen as a way to brand the university rather than a genuine um, desire to, to, prom to promote the local knowledge. Um, yeah, and then uh, all the universities wanted to get involved because they wanted to build capacity in online learning. And I guess that has been very useful in this um, COVID-19 period. Um, but what I wanted to um, draw attention to is the last point, and that's the, that to support people outside the university. So basically, um, marginalized groups. And if you see only one of the four universities explicitly said that this was their goal, um, two other universities um, made no comment about it. And um, university two said, uh, actually said, um, that was not their purpose, but University 2 is actually a unique case in, in, um, in these universities because they actually didn't, they weren't on a, a, a global MOOC, pro, MOOC platform. They actually had inward facing online courses to their students. Um, so technically they were not MOOCs, but the reason that I included them was actually because they had the capacity to reach far more marginalized um, youth um, because of their regional focus. So yeah, so the next point I wanted to highlight is how different universities have different levels of access to MOOC platforms. So the comment from Riyadh outlines the story of how he they approach, approached um, three, three different um, platforms. They approached Coursera, edX, and FutureLearn, and Coursera didn't even get back to them. Um, edX was, got back to them, but the joining fees were too high. And then um, FutureLearn uh, did allow them to get on board, but they didn't get on board as a university. They had to get on board first as a center for excellence and prove their worth before they could be accepted as a university. Then on the other hand, Mishka from University 2 um, stated that um, their institution was approached from various platforms, including FutureLearn and Coursera, and they ended up going with two platforms. So you can see really um, the difference uh, that a university's elite status or ranking status can have on whether they're able to produce MOOCs. And um, this has further ramifications because um, Different platforms have different uh, pedagogical underpinnings or philosophical underpinnings. So edX might be more lecturer centric, FutureLearn might be more um, social focused. And um, 
this basically limits the type of MOOC that you can create if you, are, if you don't really have the choice to choose from these platforms. And just an overall statement that the reason that they decided to create their courses on these MOOC platforms was because they wanted, because of the goal that I mentioned, or the rationale I mentioned in the previous slide about wanting to uh, brand the university on a global space. So that's why they chose to go with these rather than, for example, creating courses on, on Moodle or smaller level um, online courses. So um, now we'll unpack the conceptualizing the MOOC um, sphere. So in, in the sphere, um, I really want to um, center the role of the MOOC designer. After the institutional rationales and decisions have been made, the MOOC designer is, is then the biggest decision maker in what happens going forward. And as I outlined earlier, MOOC designers' identity strongly influence the MOOC and in all phases of the design, from choosing the target groups to the purpose to participation and, and um, participatory practices. Um, so what was really nice about the best practices that I learned from was that um, in, in a few justice-orientated MOOCs, um, if there were gaps in knowledge, they sought out experts or practitioners or teaching assistants or even students to partake in the MOOC formulation. Thank, thank you, Maha. Bye. Um, and um, this, this was really nice to see that at a conceptualization phase, at, a, at the point when the ethos of the MOOC was being formulated, they invited different, different people. And they even meant some, some of the MOOC designers mentioned you know, including people with disabilities, including people from different cultures and religions as well. Um, so, so there was really, uh, in these good examples, there were a lot of decision makers at the table. Um, the other good practice that I saw from, from these MOOCs was that when partnerships uh, were made, um, it, uh, it allowed for the MOOC to have access um, into rural areas, and it also moved away from having the academic voice to having more relevant, grounded, and practical um, experiences and voices within the MOOC. So um, this slide basically focused on um, the people who are designing the MOOC, the MOOC designers, and how uh, basically the more di epistemically diverse um, these people are, the more inclusive a MOOC can be. Now this next slide focuses on uh, the philosophical underpinnings of MOOCs. And basically here, I talk about how the, the MOOC designers themselves are, have um, various subjectivities and perspectives. And each person's individual subjectivities and perspectives get embedded into their MOOC. So maybe, um, you know, their specific beliefs about something of how the world functions is embedded into their MOOC. And so, if you have a diverse team of an epistemically diverse team of MOOC designers, you can then challenge these philosophical underpinnings because you have people that contribute from different worldviews. So these philosophical pinnings could um, also fall under maybe pedagogical differences in terms of how um, which pedagogy one would prefer or promote. Um, for example, if you look at different schools of thoughts in a MOOC. Um, the best practice here would be that, um, for example, if you're talking about continental philosophy, have have a bigger picture so that you see that continental philosophy is also, uh, you know, alongside analytical philosophy. Whereas if you only give one perspective on something and the participant does not know better that of how this the school of thought fits into the bigger picture, you can actually give, be giving them a false or a limited view of something. So it's really important within a MOOC to state explicitly what your philosophical underpinnings are and basically what agendas are being promoted or counted. And these agendas don't necessarily mean something bad. So for example, one of the agendas would be to promote um, inclusive education or the idea, idea that um, learners with disabilities should be going to norm, to normal schools and not have separate schools. Uh, a particular agenda that one promotes. So it's not necessarily a, a good or bad thing, but from and being explicit about what your ideals are.
Um, so yeah, the next slide focuses on the purpose of the MOOC. And I, I drew on these purposes by, uh, from Laura Sazenovitz's paper. Um, so the main categories that are outlined um, are from her, uh, from her paper. However, I've added more subcategories. Um, the slide is taking a bit longer to load. Uh, let me just go one back. Yeah, so um, within these categories, um, the the marginalized participants that I uh, that I worked with, the the PMPs, they fell mainly into the gateway skills category and the work skill category. And what came out quite strongly from my research was that the the, the these MOOC platforms like Coursera, edX, FutureLearn, etc., they don't quite focus on the workplace skills or the vocational skills that um, marginalized groups often look for because they're looking for more um, basic vocational skills rather than cash, catchy niche um, topics. And uh, actually the, the platform called Allison seemed to, to respond better to, to these sort of vocational needs. So that was quite interesting. And yeah, gateway, gateway MOOCs showed a positive relationship to um, supporting marginalized groups. So um, these would be access, MOOCs that would help, um, you know, help um, those who are not in university gain access into university or to support the current students within the university. So um, just unpacking this a bit more, um, there were a few leverage points that came out from, from looking at the different purposes of MOOCs. And some of the justice-orientated MOOCs, they basically um, responded faster to, or MOOCs in general, tended to respond faster to hot topics, environmental concerns, and current affairs. Um, and even with the, with the current pandemic right now, MOOCs are often able to respond faster to creating content for these situations um, rather than conventional or traditional classes, which would have to go through a lot of bureaucratic processes. Um, the second leverage point of MOOCs was that they uh, can be used as a test bed for testing out new ways of thinking and approaching topics. So this could be, for example, um, the medicine and the arts MOOC from UCT. So an idea that, uh, you know, uh, looking at interdisciplinary research that might not be um, done yet in in the university itself as part of the core curriculum, but could firstly it could first be tested in a MOOC before it's brought into the real into the main curriculum. Sorry, um, and the third aspect was that the justice orientated MOOCs often um, were in like they were strongly tied to people and communities. So I just outlined some quotes from some MOOC designers. Who, and when they talked about the purpose of the MOOC, it was very much about the people in the MOOC, not about the content of the MOOC. So for example, Ranjani talked about uh, designing a, a public communication of sci science and spreading science to the broad lay audience. Um, Nene wanted to build a community of practice and get the stories of teachers out. Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. So um, yeah, there was a strong focus on on people, and this is very different from the focus on on just the content or on the skill or the competency, but rather about the the, the about bringing people together. Um, so so next, I through throughout the various MOOCs that I reviewed and and the MOOC designers that I interviewed, I collected basically different. Um, groups of uh, different target groups. And um, like I mentioned in the previous slide, the, the PMPs, they fell between the work seekers group and the, mar and the marginalized um, youth group. Well, by definition, the first one, of course. Um, but yes, what came out from, from the surveys with, um, with, the, with the potential MOOC participants was that they had a strong interest in uh, in content or courses that could help them um, seek employment. And like I mentioned earlier, this was not the main focus of um, 
the the major MOOC platforms because they they were more focused on on other aspects and much more focused on at a professional level. So directed at people who are likely to already have degrees. Um, so the next slide basically looks at um, the same target groups, but I break them down according to different con uh, different contexts. And I, here I just wanted to highlight. So throughout all my surveys and interviews, the different types of conditions or contextual factors um, that were highlighted um, in, in these scenarios. So basically, um, these are all the all the contexts. Or I mean, this list is not exhaustive. But I did I did try to include as many angles as possible. These are all the differing scenarios that people experience, and these are all the differing scenarios that one needs to consider when they think about um, their their participants and their different use um, the yeah the, the the part the context of the participants. Um, so yeah, now we move to situating the MOOC and the first aspect is the technological accessibility. So I don't want to spend too much time on this because I think this is um, the most obvious of situating the MOOC. And this is possibly what um, the MOOC designers did the best. Most people were quite conscious of, of this. So um, making MOOCs mobile compatible, ensuring that videos are short and that they're transcribed, ensuring um that the content can be downloadable and often they made it um like um low data downloads and zip files and yeah the use of whatsapp to support whatsapp is possibly the most interesting of this list but i'll come to it again in a later slide um so yeah the next the next topic was uh language accessibility in terms of situating the MOOC. And this is where I felt that the massiveness of MOOCs is often most at odds with supporting marginalized groups when it comes to languages. Now, the potential MOOC participants, they wanted MOOCs in English. And so the, the decision to make MOOCs in English supported this. However, in the, in the choice of the additional languages for transcribing and Sorry, for, for subtitles and transcriptions, um, the MOOC designers chose French or, or, or other colonial languages. And here, this is where I argue that actually, if you really wanted to support marginalized groups and take a more justice oriented approach, there are many widely spoken continental lingua franca like Swahili or Hausa or Hindi that could actually reach millions of users. And these users um, are less likely to be able to access the resources that would be provided in global languages. So if you had a, a French learner in, in somewhere in West Africa, the, if someone is able to speak French, they already have some level of privilege over someone, for example, who only speaks Hausa. And so considering that th there are these languages that have millions, hundreds of millions of speakers, we really should be looking to um, shift to these um, lingua franca languages. And just on the point of local languages like Isizulu or Isikosa, um, the fact that South African MOOC, MOOCs chose not to um, translate into this language just once again shows the, that massiveness is at odds with supporting um, the marginalized groups. Um, now, the next aspect that I talk about is um, learner support. And this is really, really one of the most crucial parts of, of access. So just following Keddie's um, breakdown of access, the one hand of it is to provide access to equitable materials. But the second side of it is to ensuring that you support those that are not equitably positioned to access these resources. And that support is a very important part of access. Um, so I gave some tips uh, for um, how learner support can be improved in MOOCs. And this is from the best practices that I reviewed in, in this. 
So the first would be giving very explicit um, guidelines to how to navigate around a MOOC. Um, and um, basically, for example, the, the, the screenshot I've taken from the Education for All MOOC, they first listed an article on how to use FutureLearn, which is from FutureLearn. But the second and third point um, was information that was more specific to their MOOC, and they added specific guideline documents. So being very explicit about guiding the, the, um, the participant is, is quite important in this. And then uh, the last point is designing multiple pathways that can contribute, that can accommodate different levels of participants. So if a learner um, or a participant um, is quite, um, you know, quite um, supported in self-directed learning, then you could give them further options. For example, um, writing a blog or something over and above um, the, the basics of the course. Um, so just to add on to three, three more levels of learner support um, is really centering the human. So one uh, nice best practice that was suggested was um, encouraging participants to invite a friend or colleague along with them to do the MOOC so that they have a real person that they know with them doing the MOOC. Um, the MOOC designer's personality um, and demeanor and their level of openness was also quite contagious to the MOOC participants. So if they were open, they found that MOOC, MOOC uh, participants were also quite open. Now, in terms of teaching assistance, um, there was a sort of difference of opinion, not, well, um, a difference of strategies rather. So some MOOC designers felt that they had to be the ones that were going through the discussion board because they needed to um, you know, be directly engaged with the learners. And in other MOOCs, um, the MOOC designer didn't um, engage much on the discussion groups, but they let um, teaching assistants do this. Now, both strategies are quite important because the teaching assistant can um, possibly be um, more amicable. They might be more friendly and um, more accessible to, to the participants, whereas the MOOC uh, instructor needs to be part of these group discussions as well because they need to actually in, um, gauge what the um, what the participants are feeling and experiencing, um, and the last one was MOOC designer training. And this sounds like quite obvious, but so many of the MOOC designers that I interviewed were like, "I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't know what a MOOC was. I've never done a MOOC before. We were just trying something out." So yeah, it's really important to have uh, MOOC designers. Um, being trained. And of course, these were first time MOOC designers. So um, these were pilot projects. So it's understandable that they didn't know what they were doing. But going forward, um, perhaps some guidelines such, such as what I'm presenting now is really important for MOOC designers to, to know and to think about. Um, Martin, I'm, I'm, I'm conscious of time and I know I've spoken over time. So do you want me to, to continue with my last few slides? Uh, I have just about four more. Okay, just I think yeah, we'd like to leave some um, time for so questions. Long. So, um, yeah, if we can leave some time for the, questions, we can the leave last some point for is, ten minutes at the end. Yeah, okay, that should I should cool. be done. Yeah. So the last point was situating uh, the MOOC in terms of awareness and advertising, and if I could choose one part to focus on in all of these suggestions, I think this would be it because over overall, people did make effort to to create MOOCs in justice-orientated ways. The main barrier was that marginalized groups did not know about them. Nobody knows what a MOOC is. And if they know what a MOOC is, they don't actually know that it's for them. So they think that it's for someone um, that has you know, full-time um, uh, online access. But actually, many of the MOOCs in South Africa were, were designed so that you could design it to use them offline. Or Coursera MOOCs, for example, can be used offline on the app. So sharing knowledge about how to, how to um, use MOOCs is really important. And I just highlighted some more um, justice-orientated approaches, such as 
going to local radio stations and local TV um, uh, channels that could access these better or using participant stories. So someone from a certain township or a village telling their story of how they use the MOOC can make it much more relatable um, to potential users. And also just word of mouth. So if, if you can actually, so this was in Johannesburg, there was one MOOC that just went viral because of word of mouth and it had like a huge number of South Africans in it. Um, so that was quite interesting. Um, so the next slide, I talk about power structures. So um, I'll just be brief on this. And, I'll, and basically the idea here is that um, there are different configurations of relationships between uh, the designer and the instructor and, um, and, and, the par and the participants themselves. And between the top one, the MOOC decreed, uh, the management decreed MOOC and the student led MOOC, there's actually quite an interesting story um, where both of these MOOCs were at the same university, had the same target group, and um, yeah, and and basically the same topic. They were both about decolonizing education, but they manifested completely differently just because of the power structures of the MOOC. Um, okay, and moving on to the next slide is the different pedagogies. So what I found was that the whole um, C MOOC X MOOC um, distinction between uh, you know the type of pedagogies was quite outdated and in fact um, most MOOC designers used a variety of pedagogies in in their MOOCs so they you know they would have a combination uh, I wouldn't say all of them but I would say um, the the ones that aim to be more justice orientated definitely used a variety of pedagogies um, in in their MOOCs what was interesting was that no MOOC in South Africa used connectivist approaches. And just drawing on one MOOC designer's comment, he said that um, the, the Coursera, Futula, and edX platforms, they don't encourage you to use other means. So they don't encourage you to use Twitter or WhatsApp. They want you to keep everything on their platform. And that really limits the connectivist approaches that you can use. So for people who are just starting up and learning about MOOC design, um, there was, yeah, there was just basically very little connectivist approaches within the South African context. And I'm not sure if that would change. Um, so in participation strategies, um, these were quite interesting. And I think the most novel one was the, the Q&A uh, session. And I, and I don't think I'd seen that much in others, where they basically asked um, learners to, participants to submit uh, questions and then they made a podcast, so just an audio only podcast of the answers. And they did this on a weekly basis. So the MOOC wasn't something that was pre recorded weeks or months ago, but it actually had a very live response uh, feel to it. The other interesting thing was um, how WhatsApp groups organically arose in many of the African and South African um, MOOCs. And uh, this was done from, from the participants themselves. I'll just move on to the last slide on content. So um, the main point here that I wanted to make, and I alluded to it a little bit earlier, was that um, yes, there's definitely, if, if for people who know me, I've always been pitching for a strong emphasis on relevance and local knowledge. Um, however, what I saw in in this um, in the in this review of the MOOCs was that often Africanness was used as a selling point while it neglected to actually cater for people living in resource-constrained context. And so the MOOCs ended up being about developing country context, but not necessarily for developing country context. And that's something that I wanted to caution on, because just bringing it back to my conceptual framework, there was a strong focus on challenging these epistemic injustices, but not necessarily the material injustices. Okay, I will stop there now because I've gone over time. Um, yeah, uh, but yes, please, please do ask any questions. Um, and so, yeah, sorry if I'm not presenting very well because I'm, I'm more of a conversational speaker and to speak for 40 minutes 
by myself is a little bit difficult for me. <laughs> it's always difficult on a webinar as well because you're not getting the reaction, are you? It's what you oh, thank you very much, Tuskin. Exactly, yeah. People could uh, yeah. give their applause in the chat box. Um, and then uh, any questions that people want to take, I can give the microphone. So Joe says, so the big question is about how to make design of MOOC distinct from the skills in it. How did you find the approaches able to grow beyond the one direction habit? Does that make sense, Taskin, or should I see if we can get Joe to elaborate on um, it? Yeah, Joe, Joe, can you elaborate a bit on that, please? Let me see if I can... Um, oh, hi, Aras. You should be able to speak. So, Joe, you should be able to speak if you want to. If you roll your mouse over the, the box, so you see GoGM webinar, a little microphone icon should pop up and you can click on that and you can speak. Uh, but if not, if anyone wants to put any other questions, mic not working. Okay. Do you want to elaborate in the chat box, um, Joe? If not, does anyone else have any other questions in the chat box that we can um, give to Tuskeen? I'll wait for some people to see some people are typing. So. Yeah, no, uh, Joe, jo, um, I don't quite understand. So, distinct how to make design of MOOCs distinct from the skills. The Can you hear me in... now? Yay! Yay! Hi! Yes. <laughs> um, okay, you know, I, I was really <laughs> latching on to... Yeah, hello! It's lovely to hear from you. And I'm... Yeah, no, I'm very excited to be a part of this. I, I was really happy to hear um, what you've been saying. So I, I think what I've been trying to... Um, Oh, oh, latching into, can you hear me okay? Is that all right? Oh, yeah. Okay, good. Um, it was, it, <sighs> so what were you, you were saying about the, um, um, the design of the MOOCs about being, um, Um, more kind of, I'm so sorry. I'm just <laughs> at this point, I'm not really like really like, okay. So what I'm, I'm trying to say is that <laughs> I feel like I'm being put on the spot. Um, um, so what you were saying about the, um, I'm just trying to scroll up to your other slides, but now I'm on your references. Um, but uh, what you were saying about the okay, the, tell me what the you want to get to. no 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 it's okay but the references um, yeah so your your reference to um, the people that were more likely to um, kind of scope in on the um, content and that's what the question was about um, so. You, the likelihood that people would be more um, focused on um, your ability to kind of talk about content versus the, the, the learning processes that were more accessible to people. And so the asynchronous um, flexibility, for example, or the, um, you know, the ability for the MOOCs to provide in their design uh, beyond that kind of um, one mode delivery. I'm, I'm sorry if I'm not making myself clear. Shall I try and articulate? And you can say um, okay, I'll, I'll take a stab. I think, uh, I, think I get what you're talking about. So, so, so I, I think you're trying to differentiate between the focus on content so so what i said earlier yeah. was that like when people think about designing a mooc they go to content right that's a, yeah. i mean i was right. i think i was um kind enough to add on pedagogy and participation and power structures in that category but actually yeah. most people just think content is the only part of designing a mooc and here content <laughs> is like one tiny bit of what 
much mm. bigger process, right? That, that's what I, that's my, I think it was the, the, the nail on the head, actually. That's exactly what I was trying to, to point out, <laughs> is that the whole MOOC design process is a much bigger picture thing. Um, yeah. And situating the MOOC, so like you're saying, the synchronous and asynchronous access, um, you know, the technology, language, these are all aspects that need to be thought about when you're designing the MOOC at very early stages of design, not something you think about after. It can, of course, be rectified after, but right. if you design for these situations, right. it's much better than thing after. Yeah, and I think I think what I was doing was I was putting uh, questions alongside as you were talking, and so um, when you were saying how people were um, discussing like these types of things, I think it, it perhaps might have been a very interesting conversation to have with people as they were designing and um, these moves, and you know with this asynchronous trend that's now become quite popular. Um, you know, everyone's starting to think, oh, well, you know, <laughs> um, it's, 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 it's very um, impressive to a lot of people. So I'm, I'm thinking that um, the way that that is designed um, might, for a social justice per perspective and the way that, you know, that's inclusive of a lot of, of, of a lot of different perspectives might be um, really, important and so i don't know if that's a question i'm so sorry if that's not but um yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's all i have to say thank you i think it, the point you yeah. make joe and Tus yeah. tuskin made that's that's really important is that and we found it at the ou with learning design as well was that you're absolutely right Tuskin, that people go straight to content it's like i'm teaching a course on you know uh, American literature movies. Like, okay, we're going to do. We're going to cover X, Y, and Z, and they, and and they don't go beyond the content often. And so, what we found with our learning design tools was, um, it wasn't like they were anything special, but it's almost like they were a prompt to think about how could we teach this differently. And you know, I think that's just all you need is some way of making them sort of step back from that content mode in a way, I think. And I think you could see that your model, correct me if I'm wrong to scheme, but I think your model of um, that you're on, on the screen now is is also a way of making people just step back from that. Um, whereas in, in the alone Science tools, it's much more about the kind of pedagogy, but you're almost like in terms of, a, you know, um, uh, in terms of equity and, and inclusion and those sort of things. So I, and I think as soon as you make yeah. people just give them some framework to to stop, as it were, <laughs> and rethink what they're doing, then they they can work with it. You know, it's like a would that be a, a fair assessment to think that's game? Martin, I've lost your sound. I can can people hear me? Bye, Ada. Stops talking. <laughs> it, may, it may have just seen that I kind of randomly stopped, but I stopped talking. <laughs> um, there, there's a question from Kai. Uh, you mentioned that uh, you mentioned the MOOC designers did not move out of the LMS. Was it a lack of digital fluency of the MOOC designers, or were there institutional barriers? I don't think there were institutional barriers, but I honestly think that in South Africa, these were the at least at the point when I was doing my interviews, this was the first time that they were doing a MOOC. And so they were basically following it to the book. If Coursera said do this, they were doing that. Whereas um, in the OU, for example, um, people are, are, are much more familiar with MOOCs and so they can experiment with, with hybrid pedagogies or, or different sorts of formulations. So I do think that um, in the future, um they would break out of it i think the limitation that i was trying to outline was that the platforms themselves don't encourage it because it's all about data collection they want to collect learner analytics and if now learning is happening outside of the platform then they don't get a full picture of the learning happening uh, 
Okay. Um, we've gone four o'clock, and I know people have to go and may have other meetings. So I'm going to stop recording. That.